I was with Rocky Mountain Institute for uh, 17 years, and in the mid-90s, we were working on a series of case studies for a book uh, with, which Jonathan had a major role in on green developments, green real estate projects. And we were collecting case studies, and we kept finding these interesting examples of fairly dramatic cases of increase in worker productivity as a result of the green building measures. Um, and one of the first was a postal sorting facility where they did a lighting retrofit, and it went from a three-year payback to a nine-month payback because of the dramatic number of pieces per mail sorted per hour increase. That, however, led, sort of begged a que larger question, though, of how could I predict where I would find these gains in productivity? And in many ways, even though the productivity numbers are huge financial benefit, and most office buildings, a 1% gain in productivity is more than your annual energy bill. And we were documenting 6 to 16% gains in, in productivity. So that led us into a conversation with Stephen Kellard at Yale, uh, Judy Herwag at the University of Washington, um, around work that had been started by E.O. Wilson at Harvard on a topic he called biophilia. And this is, uh, this is Edward Wilson's uh, sort of a short form of Edward's uh, definition of biophilia. And so this field of research um, extends into a variety of different areas. It, it extends into cultural anthropology, it extends into um, evolutionary psychology, um, it gets into uh, genetic memory, um, and there's some really interesting pieces of work around it. This was a study done by Roger Ulrich at the University of Texas in 1984, where they looked at patients recovering from a specific pancreas operation that this clinic was known for. And the patients were grouped by demographics and even the paint color of their room. The only variable was half of the patients had a view to this brick wall. And the other half of the patients had the view to this little clump of trees and shrubs. And this is where the presentation at the beginning of the day looped in so strongly for me, because it gets right at the heart of this. Patients who had the view of the brick wall stay an average of 8.4 days. The patients in recovery, the patients had the view to the trees and shrubs were out of the hospital in 7.5 days, basically one day shorter. They took on average about two-thirds of the number to half the number of painkillers, and they had half the number of nursing calls of the patients who saw the view to the brick wall. Um, and we're finding more and more and more and more of these case studies. So what we've done in our work over the last few years is try to classify biophilia and how do you elicit these sorts of responses in the built environment. And where we've come to is there are essentially three categories of biophilic response. The first we call nature in the space, the second is natural analogs, and the third is the nature of the space. Nature in the space is sort of the most obvious. Direct contact with nature in the built environment. And this is something that cultures have done worldwide, time immemorial. The second is natural analogs. Um, you know, if you look at the decoration of this room, if you look at the textures of the wood and all of that, you have direct references to nature in the fabric of this space, natural analogs. This elicits a response. The response seems to be not quite as strong as direct contact to nature, but it still elicits a response. The third is maybe the hardest to explain uh, but in some ways, we're discovering the most powerful of the three when in used in combination. And that's called the nature of the space. And this is a series of spatial experiences or spatial patterns that elicit a physiological and psychological response to people moving through or sitting in that place. So I'll give you a couple of those patterns. The first one is prospect. This is where you're sitting up 
on an elevated area and you're looking out across the terrain. And it was so great to watch as people came into the room, the first people came into the room, sat in the prospect space in this room. They were also getting at, to a certain extent, this condition, which is called refuge, where your back is protected, and to a certain extent, you have a canopy or you have the um, coverage overhead. So the, one of the most powerful um, experiences is when you're sitting in a place where you have both prospect and refuge. And so here's uh, sitting on a porch looking out across the African savanna. You've got the overhang, your back is protected, you're nurtured by the, surrounded and nurtured by the space, but you've got this incredible view out across the landscape. Now, I chose the savanna landscape because one whole area of this research is called the savanna hypothesis, and this is where they get into the deep genetic memory saying, look, all our evidence indicates that humans evolved on the savannas of Africa, and we carry around memories of that with us, and we replicate that ecosystem all over the world. And in fact, it's so embedded that the savannas in the Midwest and the East Coast of the United States pre-Columbian contact was the predominant ecosystem here. And it was maintained by annual burning of the peoples in, in the Midwest and the East Coast. And it was so pervasive that you can actually see it in their language. In the Ojibwe language, uh, in the Chicago region, the Ojibwe word for prairie was Mishkota, which translates literally the burn over bear place, which makes sense because the word for fire is Mishkot. Their word for the savanna forest, which is this open canopy forest with shade trees, you know, which you would recognize on any golf course, any front suburban lawn, most parks, spreading shade trees, the low flowers growing underneath, was the Matikwaki. The literal translation of that word is the safe place. The closed canopy forest, like we see a little further out here, and in many places today, was the Wanaqua, the scary place. The scary place. And a thicket edge at, at the boundary between those, if you walk through that thicket edge you, as you come out of the bright sunlight or, or the dappled sunlight of the savanna and into that dark forest and you're te temporarily blinded as you go through that thicket edge, was a word that is considered one of the worst possible things you could say to another human. It is the akaka, the place of death, the place of mortal fear. And so you see these things embedded in language and culture. So what happens when you put all of these pieces together, nature in the space, natural analogs, um, and the nature of the space, these three-dimensional patterns, you can wind up with places like this. Now, there's some architects in the room, so you can't play this game. <laughs> this is an office building. Show of hands. Is it 1950? Is it 1960? How about 1939? This is uh, the Johnson Wax Building, the administration building, built in 1939. The grandchildren of the original employees are working in this building. When you interview them, they love working in this space. Think of another office building that is used in the same way it was originally, right? Yeah, they've changed chairs, but they're still even using the original furniture in this space. That, is a bio, that, for us, is what the power of biophilic design is. So I'll end with that. Thanks. <laughs>